Testing. Test. That is all right. <laughs> Um, before I move on, I will have a little, I, I got a bunch of similar questions from, um, an office hours today. So let me, uh, kind of go over those questions just, to, uh, you know, maybe might help out. Um, one generic kind of question is, let me just kind of explain philosophically what we're doing here. All right. Plus, okay, this is the generic feedback network, right? And we have a, let's say it's, let me redraw this. A bit better. So we, we start off a lot bigger. All right. So we have a resistance here. We've got a Resistance here. Let's say it's a voltage voltage thing of some sort. This has a resistance here. This has some output with the resistance here. Connects up to here. Say it's something like this. Okay, so our basic strategy has been to calculate the equivalent resistance down here and include that as a loading on the basic amplifier up here. And then the question that came up today several times was, well, what about this feedback factor thing? I mean, uh, the F, don't, where do we include the loading with that? So what's really happening here is when we do this loading effects, what we're trying to do is to calculate the loop gain. All that's about is trying to calculate this T prime. What is the loop gain? We could have done this. We could have calculated the effects of the loading of the basic amplifier on the feedback network. In other words, I could have included these resistors down here if I wanted to. Okay? Now, there's the F factor here, though. Okay? So F times, you know, for here it's V out, let's say. The question about this F, does it have some something to do with this loading? The reason the F is the ideal value of this dependent source here is because what we're worried about then isn't trying to calculate the loop gain. What we're trying to calculate then is what happens while the loop's actually operating. While the loop's actually operating, it's in these input and output values are essentially near their ideal value. Okay. In other words, when we drive from the output here, we are assuming all our, all our assumptions are relying on the fact that T prime's large. If, we, if T prime isn't big, if the loop gain's not big, this analysis that we do is not correct. I mean, we, we need to have a large T prime. When we have a large loop gain, then for this circuit, which is kind of a shunt type sensing, this output is going to appear to be virtually ideal, have a very low impedance value, very low resistance. So that means we're driving this output with almost an ideal value. So the fact that we have a load resistance here and have a load resistance and resistance here isn't important because 
the feedback makes this point appear to be a very low impedance value, right? You know, it's R out divided by 1 plus T. And if this is large, this is going to be, appear to be nearly zero. So we have no loading effects of this feedback network as far as the input to the feedback network is concerned. Similarly with the output. I mean, for this case, we have an error voltage which is developed across this resistor. And when the feedback's happening, okay, this is Rn, V error is driven to zero. That's what the feedback does. If this is driven to zero, that means there's zero voltage across this resistor. You know, it's V, the, the current, let's call this I, I in. I in is equal to V error divided by R in. If V error goes to zero, that means I in goes to zero. That means this is zero here. That means this is open, right? So far as the feedback circuit's concerned, this fact that the feedback has, you know, an output resistance associated with it isn't important because it's actually driving into an ideal load for it. The feedback makes it an ideal load. And so that this appears to be an open circuit, so it doesn't matter what this resistor is here. So that's why it only, when we do the feedback factor, we only have to worry about what the actual dependent source is because we're not going to see any loading effects when the feedback circuit's actually operating. The feedback, the loading effects come in when we're calculating the loop gain, right? Which is not, it's, which is a different part of the calculation in some sense. Get that? So we include the effects of the loading to get T prime. When we're worried about the F factor, we assume that we have the feedbacks in operation and there's no, we don't see the effects of the loading as far as the feedback operation itself. Let me do a different. <clears throat> let me um, do a problem for you here. So let me um, let me do a a here's another way to do these feedback problems. Okay. In some sense, it's easier. In some in other ways, it okay. So let's. Um, Hopefully, this is right. Okay, here's another one of these. What kind of feedback is this? <laughs> Shunt or series? We're sensing current, right? Because we're down in the source. We're not touched, not connected to V out. So this is series type sensing. And are we, and how are we feeding it back? Series or shunt? It's a voltage feedback, right? Because we're developing a V air here. Here's V in. Here's V feedback right here. So this is series, series. So they call this a series triple. Okay. All right. The a way another, let's call this R1, R2, and R3. We'll call these RD. Here's a whole different way to calculate loop gain. Okay? It's called the break the loop technique. Okay? What you can do is you can go in here. And this is the tricky part. You've got to break the loop at a spot where you don't have, where you're not changing the loading effects. So in other words, if I break the loop right here, in other words, I, I, I go into the circuit and I break the feedback by disconnecting that, this little spot right here. I take the wire out, okay? This is a perfect place to do it because this is a, an infinite input resistance, right? This point here has no loading on this point. If I break the wire, it's still the same loading because this is now sitting in the air also has no loading effect. So I can break the loop at this point and not change the loading on this previous stage. You, some circuits you can't find a spot that does that. And I'll tell you how to handle that in a second. But let, right now, for this circuit it works great. So now I break the loop and then I calculate the gain starting from this way. Going, so now it's now it's, there's no feedback, right? I can go right around here Calculate this is drive this from a VN, VN test, okay, 
And I'll find this voltage here, which is sort of a V out test. Okay? And the loop gain with all loading effects will be V out test from V in test. Now notice, I don't have to care what kind of feedback it is. So this approach just goes directly after the loop gain, and it's independent of the type of feedback. Okay? Well, that's kind of neat. Get, now, unfortunately, it's neat in terms of calculating T prime. It's not so neat because you still got to know what kind of feedback it is to figure out if you divide by 1 plus T or multiply by 1 plus T, right? So it doesn't solve that problem for you, and that's really the critical problem. You got to know what kind of feedback you have to know what are you increasing or decreasing output and input resistance, right? And it doesn't tell you what F is, but it tells you T prime. Okay, so how would you calculate T prime from this? Well, you start from here, drive this point from here to here. What is it? Well, it's a source follower. And for this circuit, what we'd have to do, we, we have to look up into here. And we see this is like 1 over GM, okay? So we could see that the resistance looking down here, the source resistance of this source follower, is actually going to be what? I'll just say right here. R source here is going to be equal to R3 in parallel with R2 plus R1 in parallel with 1 over GM. So that's the resistance looking down here, so let's call this R source 3. This is transistor 3 here, right? 2, 1. So we can say, okay, so from here to here, the gain is GM R source 3 over 1 plus, this is GM3, right? GM3 times R source 3. So that's the gain of this stage. Then we have, we start here, and we got a voltage divider going on, right? So I go from here to here, I got to do a voltage divider. So let's, I'll do that here. So that's going to be R1 in parallel with 1 over GM over R2 plus R1 uh, in parallel with 1 over GM. That gets me the voltage to here. So I went from here to here, from here to here. Then I need to go from here to here. Well, this is a common gate. Okay, doesn't matter what's happening over here. We assume the independent source, we assume that's a ground, so it's like a common gate. So from here to here, it's going to be GM1 times RD. And of course, looking down here, it's going to be a really large resistance because it's got this source degeneration. So we'll assume, you know, that looking down this way, that's very large compared to RD, so it's just GM1 times RD. And then we go from here to here, that's another, that's times. GM2 times RD. So this is equal to T prime. All right? So I basically just go around this loop and find what this voltage is. And, and you can drive it with a current and come back and find the output current. You just need to find the ratio of current to current or voltage to voltage. It didn't do this method because you still need to figure out all this, what kind of feedback it is and how to but this does work. In Gray and Meyer, there's an extension to this, okay? Paul Hurst, one of my students a bunch of years ago, he's now a professor at UC Davis. He didn't like the way we've been doing this in class. It bugged him when he was a student, okay? Mm -hmm. So he went through and he figured out, okay, what's, there's approximation being made in the, pro in the approach that we're doing it. It's some feedback approximations that we're, we're, we're sort of assuming some things are that T prime's large and we're not including some loading effects exactly right. It's good, good approximations, though, if T prime's large. He wanted to do this. This works very well if you can break at a spot where, you know, the loading after you break is exactly the same as the loading before you break it. What he did was went through and sort of worked out through the circuit theory, and you could break it anywhere. You could break it right here. And what he does is he goes in and he figures out what the output resistance looking this way is. He figure out what the input resistance looking this way is. He worked through the formulas. He's got a little complicated set of formulas. And after you do all that, you can get exactly the loop gain 
and if breaking anywhere inside the loop. So it's a fairly general expression approach to this problem that gives you the exact right answer. It would be what you get from Spice. It'll always get exactly what Spice gives you then. That was what bothered him. <coughs> Our approach will not give you exactly what Spice does because of this approximation of very high, high loop gain. Okay, now, I think feedback's complicated enough right now. I think you'd probably agree with me there, right? I wouldn't go after a whole bunch of new ways to do this problem. But if you're interested, after class is over in this summer, or next, I guess over, over Christmas, I guess, right? Pull out good old Gray and Meyer, get a copy of it, look at it, and you can find another way to do these problems. Okay, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't solve the problem, which I think is key, of identifying what kind of feedback you have, you know, where the F factor is, all of that stuff. That, that's really the, the core problem you need to figure out, right? And the, and, the, and the extra improvement you get to your answer in doing this more rigorously isn't really all that important, right? I mean, as long as your loop gain's high. So I, that's why I think what we're doing is sufficient. But be that as it may. Okay. Another question people had. Boy, it's hot today. Is that? We can't. Some days we freeze, some days we cook. All right, so um, let's, let's try to give some intuition on why the answers are the way they are, why you choose short and shunt. I mean, we have this shunt equals short and so on. But why is that happening, OK? Let me, um, OK, let me just draw this. Let's, yeah. Let me draw it again. So this is basically the one I just did, right? Let me do this one, OK? Um, OK, so this is f times v out and so on. So here's our basic feedback network. Here's, you know, basic amplifier feeding, and here's the, the feedback network drawn as a two port. But the question is, I want to talk about is, why do we, so this is a series shunt feedback, OK? In fact, I didn't want to do that. Let me, uh, let me redraw this again. I want to put the real feedback network in. I don't know why I did it that way. Let's do it this way. OK, let's look at this one. OK. So here's our feedback, R1, R2. So this is series shunt feedback. OK. Now, why, when we calculate, you know, looking into this side, we say we open this side, series shunt, right? So series means open. But why is it open? OK, so here's why. What is? This is with the feedback network when it's the loops closed. What's the whole purpose of the the purpose? But the way these feedback networks work is they're driving this error signal to zero. That's what control things all about. You have a feedback network; it drives the the error signal, whatever it is, to zero. Well, if this is being driven to zero, and this is R in, then the current. It's V error over in. The current here is zero, right? Like I said this a few minutes ago. That means looking up in here, it's open circuit. So you can sort of see the series feedback because it's driving that error voltage zero is going to make it, is it going to be an open circuit. Why is this a short circuit? The way this circuit has to work is the feedback. What it's trying to do, it's trying to take this voltage and drive this voltage be equal to this voltage to V in, right? That's what the, it's trying to drive V error to zero. So that means this voltage is trying to be driven to V in. Okay. So we're trying to make this at low impedance. We're trying to make it to equal to a voltage, a controlled voltage. That's all the loop gain is trying to do. Well, if that voltage is trying, if this circuit is trying to drive this to be V in, the way it does it is by trying to drive this voltage with the appropriate voltage divider going on to be equal 
to make this voltage equal to Vn. So V out has to be set, be large enough, that after you do this voltage divider, that this point comes out to be Vn. So that means this point, the whole loop gain is driving this point to be a constant voltage. It's trying to be a drive it to a constant voltage that makes this point equal to a voltage called the Vn voltage, okay, which sets this to zero. So if this whole circuit's trying to drive this to be equal to a set voltage, what's that mean? That means that this has actually got to be a low impedance point, right? If you're setting a voltage, that's a low impedance value. So it's all of this network, all this just trying to set this to Vn. That makes this set, try to set this to, you can see what it has to be. It's, you know, V out is simply going to be equal to um, Vn, right? equals R1 over R1 plus R2 times V out. So you can see that V out has to be equal to R1 plus R2 over R1 times V in. So this is the feedback setting this V error to zero, which makes this point equal to V in. So that means V out has to be set to a voltage as well, which makes it a low impedance point. Okay, so that's that case. Let's do like your homework. Your homework you had And we, we did series sensing, right? And let's, uh, I don't know, we can put another resistor here, I guess, and, and connect. I don't know, let's do it like this, I guess, okay? So I have series So here's V out, but that's not important. What we're really interested in, this is a current output because we're sensing a current here. So this is I out, right? In fact, in your homework, right, the output resistance you, you're, you're actually calculating from your formulas was all of this stuff in series, okay? That, that's another story. Okay, now, why, why looking this way do we see an open circuit? What we're looking at is a current. What, what this feedback network is trying to do is trying to drive a current because we're sensing the current. So what this circuit's trying to do is to set the current in this output. Okay. So that so let's make this a current, and I'll have an output resistance here. So it's trying to set this current here, so that the right uh, the right current occurs here, so that this voltage gets set to zero. So this whole circuit's trying to set a current. Well, when you try to set a current, okay, that's a high impedance idea, right? I mean, the current will be always the same no matter what voltage you have. Well, that's like a, it's like a very high impedance. So that's why sensing a current makes it look like a high impedance. Okay? And I guess what's the final one? So if we went up here and had, this is Rn, well, let's do it this way. Rn with a In, okay, so this is Rn with an In, okay, so now we're driving, so now we're, and this is grounded, so now we have shunt feedback, okay, claim this looks like a short, okay, well why is this like a short? What's going on with this circuit? It's trying to drive this error voltage to zero. This is a ground on this side of this resistor, right? It's trying to drive the error voltage to zero. That means it's trying to drive this point to zero. If it's trying to drive this point to zero, that's like a ground. So far as this circuit's concerned from this side, this feedback is trying to make this look like a virtual ground. So that's a low impedance point. So when you have shunt s feedback, it's driving into a short circuit. Yeah? Uh, is it the error signal here is the current? Yeah, the air, cur the air current signal is really the current. Right. But to sort of figure out how this circuit's really working, I think it's a little, a little bit easier to think of. You're trying to drive this voltage to zero, right? And so you can see how you're also driving the current to zero. It's, a, it's equivalent, right? But, uh, why drive the current to zero? That 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 imply that implies the voltage is going to zero too, right? Right. But why imply that the, there's a virtual ground over there? Well, because okay, this side's grounded. If there's no current, that means this voltage is equal to that voltage. So that means this is a voltage, zero, zero as well. Uh, another question is, 
does it matter that if you flip the sign, plus become well, negative? Well, it, it yeah. could make a positive feedback instead of negative feedback. But that doesn't change been. the feedback factor, those stuff. <laughs> well, feedback factor with no signs all work, if the, but the, it, long as the gain's less than one, you can have positive feedback, right? And all our circuits will, all our stuff will work positive. That's right. Okay, now that was two points. Ooh, it's so hot today. Um, what was I had to say? I had frequency long, why short, loop gain calculation. Okay, so that was all my little points today. So, any other questions about feedback? Any? Um, okay. Moving on. Okay, so um, feedback, I'll have to admit, is um, not, you know, it's got a lot of stuff going on there, right? And so um, we'll basically come back to it when we do more of the stability work. Yeah. So it's not gone from this yet. Okay, so what are we doing now? What we're doing now is feedback with stability. So let me get to where So what are we doing here? So let me just kind of review a little bit. If we start off with a A of omega, and we got a feedback circuit, and we have our, so this is, let's call it, let's say we're voltage sensing and this is VN, okay. What we're, base, what we're doing right now is, this is A of omega, is what we, what we did when we did the frequency response problems, we calculated the poles of the basic amplifier. And those poles will all be real axis poles. They'll all be sitting on the axis. And there may be some zeros floating around too. And they'll all be real axis as well. Okay? If you don't have feedback, you're only going to get real axis poles. You've got RC networks, you're only going to get real axis poles and zeros. Okay? As soon as you start putting feedback in though, things happen. Okay? As soon as we start adding this F and this thing feeding around like that, these poles start to move around. And that's what loop root locus is all about. Root locus is just telling you, as you change the loop gain, it's actually the loop gain is really the important number, but you can think of just changing the value of F. If F is zero, we've got this situation. As we start to add F and make it larger and larger, then we start, to, these poles move, the transfer function from here to here will we'll have poles in different locations. And like I said, what happens for this case, what will happen is this pole will move towards a zero. These two poles will come together, and then they'll split, and then they'll go off like this or something. They'll probably go off straight, actually. They'll go like this. Okay, so that's, that's the motion of the poles of the closed loop transfer function as a function of the loop gain. Okay? And that's typically what root locus is all about. Now, why is it so complicated? If you look at A of omega, this is our loop closed loop gain expression. A of omega is the good old basic amplifier, and that's the real axis poles that we calculated before. When we put it inside feedback, put the F around it, we get this overall transfer function, okay, from V out to Vn or S out to Sn, whatever it may be, okay. Let's let A of S, A of omega, let's let it have, you know, some transfer function like 1 plus S over, you know, P, or Z, it's a zero, right? So Z1, right? You know, one plus S over Z2. So these are the zeros of the transfer function. One plus S over P1 times one plus S over P2. I guess these are minuses, I guess, actually, right? Should be all minus there. Okay. So in other words, let's, really work with 1 minus S over P3. Let's work with, look and see what happens as a function. of This is N of S, the numerator, and D of S is the denominator. So N of S is the product of the zeros, D of S is the product of the poles. 
We plug that into this formula right here, a of omega, or a of s right now, right? So a of s is equal to n of s over d of s, whatever a of s. So I'm just replacing a of s by this numerator over denominator polynomial. And multiply it out, and you end up with this. And you can sort of see what happens. The zeros of the forward, a of s is the, the basic amplifier. So the zeros of the closed loop system is the same as the zeros of the open loop forward amplifier, the feed forward amplifier. So the zeros of the feedback amplifier aren't important. Okay? They don't affect, it's only the zeros, the closed loop will have the zeros of the closed loop system will be equal to the zeros of the forward amplifier. The poles, on the other hand, of the, oops, that's not quite true. Actually, I didn't do this whole thing. Um, well, here it is. Here, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here's, here's, and let's let, let me do it more generally. So this was just the case. This is what the forward transfer function looks like. If I have, if I let the feedback have frequency dependence as well, and let's let it look at its numerator and denominator, okay? And let's put the, substitute that into this expression for f right here. Then we get this. So here's the answer. I said it wrong a second ago. The zeros of the closed loop are equal to the zeros of the of the forward loop, and it's equal to the, and this is f, I think, here, right? So, yeah, so, the zero, so this is wrong. So it's the zeros of the closed loop system are equal to the zeros of the forward amplifier and the poles of the feedback amplifier. And the poles of this closed loop system are this complicated multiplication of the zeros and the poles polynomials together. So you can see, things are just moving all over the place, right? I mean, this means the zeros, and the zeros are kind of straightforward, but the poles are just, they're a function of the zeros and the poles. This is pretty complicated stuff. So in other words, if we have a frequency dependence of these, these two things here, we end up with poles and zeros just doing all sorts of things. The root locus helped us, can, can give you some insight into what's going on, okay? Apparently 120 right now is doing root locus plots, so you should take 120 if you really understand this stuff, right? But fortunately, we don't have to worry about all that. The root locus stuff helps give you some insights, but we can solve the problem a little bit simpler. And that's what I, the criteria I gave you last week. We just want to see if the circuit's stable or not, okay? So what we do to figure out if it's stable or not, what we figured out was that if we look at the loop gain, that's what I kind of analyzed last time for you a little bit, we can find we can check stability by looking at the loop gain and seeing if that loop gain, okay, is less than 1 when the phase shift equal 180 degrees. So the loop gain, the magnitude has to be less than 1 when the phase shifts 180 degrees, plus or minus, right? doesn't matter. So we can easily look at, a, a, if we can get the Bode plots, then we got the answer, right? So in this case here, let's say this is t, and if f equals to 1, that's this upper curve, if f equals 1, then the loop gain equals to the basic amplifier gain, right? Because we got full feedback. So this is the, so we have a lot of, the loop gain's very large in that case, okay? And we look at the point where the phase shift's 180 degrees, and the phase shift will become 180 degrees at 10 times the second pole. So we go and look at 10 times the second pole, and for this circuit, we can see the gain's 20 dB. The gain's, you know, basically a factor of 10 right at the point where the phase shifts 180 degrees. So what does that mean? Unstable. This circuit's very, very strongly unstable, okay? How can we make it stable? One thing we can do is we can change the feedback factor. Right now, what this circuit has is, you know, full feedback. I mean, we've got, you know, gain of one, okay? That's a voltage input, voltage output feedback, right? So this is F equal to one. We just tie it back. Lots of feedback, lots of chance for instability. Let's let, if we see that the gain is at 
factor of 10, 20 dB, at the point of 180 degrees, if we set f equal to 0 0.1, we can plot the new loop gain factor, right, which is going to be 0 0.1 times a of omega, right? So that means this curve moves down by a factor of 10. And that means at the point where we have the 180 degree of phase shift, we have a situation where we have a gain of exactly 1. So 0 dB equals 1. So this is right on the edge of stability. Okay? In actual fact, to make it a little bit more stable, we should have a gain f a little bit smaller than 0.1. So in other words, if we make the feedback factor 0.1 instead of 1, this circuit will become stable. If we make it 0.01, it's very stable, right? It drops way down and, and at the the gain at the 180 degree phase shift point will be well below 1. So no stability problem at all. So decreasing feedback means more stable. OK, now, here's, this seemed pretty marginal. So how do we talk about how, how much extra margin should we give ourselves when we have, we don't want to put ourselves right at the hairy edge, right? Because Different process, one run, with the circuit would work. Next process run, the circuit wouldn't work. GMs change, things like that, right? So how do we discuss how much margin we give us? OK, so that's what we're talking about. So we de define something called phase margin. Phase margin is the difference between the fa actual phase shift you have and 180 degrees when the gain's equal to 1. Okay? So in other words, for this circuit, when I set f equal to 0.1, I put the gain, the phase shift when the circuit was equal to 0.1 was 180 degrees. So the difference between 180 degrees and 180 degrees is zero. Okay? So this circuit here with f equal to 0.1 had zero degrees phase margin. No phase margin at all. On the other hand, if I did something like this, let's redraw this a little bit. Let's say here's my curve. So let me draw. Here's the, the magnitude plot, magnitude of t of omega. Here's the point of, um, this is, say, gain of 1, 0 dB. And let's say the phase shift, whatever for whatever reason, have a zero or something like that. And the phase shift <laughs> at this point right here was minus 135 degrees. Okay? If you add a zero, right, you can sort of cancel out some of the phase shift from a pole. So let's say at the, the gain's equal to 1, the phase shifts, this is the same point, the phase phase shift at this point is equal to minus 135 degrees. Well, here's minus 180 degrees here. So the phase margin we have at this point right here, theta m, because here's where the gain's 1. We check to see what the phase shift is. It's 135. So we have 45 degrees of phase margin, we say. We're 45 degrees less than 180. OK? 45 degrees of phase margin is a pretty good number. That's a pretty tip, it's a pretty easy number to work with. And I'll show you. And the reason for that is this. If you take, let's go, let's have two poles. Here's omega P1, here's omega P2. If you only have two poles in your system, what is the phase shift at the second pole? How much phase shift do you get from the first pole? Okay, let's draw that in. So you get minus 90 from the first pole. At the second pole, at 10 times below, you start getting phase shift. Right at the second pole, how much phase shift do you have? Another 45 plus the minus 90. So right at the second pole, you end up with minus 135 degrees of phase shift. 
And then if you go out further, you get, you know, 180 degrees of phase shift. So right at the second pole is 45 degrees of phase margin if the gain is equal to 1. So if we make this, if we design this thing in such a way that the magnitude of the gain, magnitude of the feedback, mag the loop gain is equal to 1, at this point right here, we'll have 135 degrees of phase margin. Can you, can you see how to do that? H how would you design this circuit to make this gain equal to 1? What, what would you change? If I gave you your circuit and the phase margin was 0, what would you change? Okay, first thing you'd say, I'll change the feedback factor F. Okay, so let's say your fixed feedback factor often is set, let's say, you know, it's V out over VN equals 1 over F, right? So sometimes you're set, the feedback factor is set by how much gain you want. So let's say it's equal to 10, so that means F half is equal to 0.1. So you're kind of stuck there. Some specifications stick get you. What else might you change? You're now a designer, okay? I want to make this circuit have 45 degrees of phase margin, and I let's say I, I have zero degrees phase margin to start with. This, the gain here is at, let's say the gain at this point right off when I first gave you the circuit is 10, with a feedback factor of 0.1. What would I, what could I do to make this circuit work? Reduce what? Okay, I could reduce the open loop gain, okay? problem with that is, if I reduce the open loop gain, I'm reducing the loop gain, right? So that kind of doesn't work so well. If we really want to have nice low output resistance divided by 1 plus T prime, right, then I'm beginning to hurt myself a little bit, right? And remember, this is F is, it's 1 over F times T prime over 1 plus T prime. So dropping A is usually not so good, right? Because we want to have a nice big loop gain. So what, what's the next thing I can do then? Reduce the frequency of the first pole. That's absolutely right. That's and that's what we'll basically do. We'll go after this first pole and start moving it back. This is called narrow band compensation. And basically, what we'll do is we'll move that pole back enough so that when the, we get to this second pole, if I'm trying for 45 degrees of phase margin, that the gain will be right. So here's a question for you. Let's say the gain is 10 at that second pole. How far do I have to move that first pole back in order to have 45 degrees of phase margin? Okay, you see that? I'm telling you. This. So we agree now we have to move this pole back because when we move this pole back, this curve is going to get lower. If this is a 10, and I want to get this down to 1, how far do I have to move this pole back? How much? 10 times. Is that right? Is that right? That's right. Okay, right. So, yeah. Remember, this falls off inversely with frequency. So if I want to reduce the gain by 10, I just got to move the pole back by 10. So if I move the pole to 0.1 omega P1, then this will drop down to a gain of 1. So that's what I say. So think about, you know, one pole roll off is just inverse with frequency. So you can sort of see what you have to do to poles to make things work. Okay. So that's, we jumped ahead a bunch there, okay? But that's, that's really stability, okay? What you got to do is get this curve, get this curve, get the Bode plots, look at them for the, figure out the feedback factor that you need, Calculate your T, look and see how much, figure out how much phase margin you want to have, and then adjust the pole, and maybe you can do some other things. I'll give you some other tricks we can use. But basically what you normally do is move the lowest frequency pole. Put it to a lower frequency. Okay? What is, let me just say a little bit more, and this will become very important in your next project. Okay? And you begin to see this effect already. This is the close. This is the closed loop gain. This is the magnitude of V out over V in. If it's a voltage in, voltage out, two port, right? So this is the closed loop gain. Okay. This is with the feedback. This is from here to here with all the feedback. 
task. So polls have moved all over the place now, right? Because we've added the feedback. This is what, and you saw this effect. This is what the, this is versus frequency here. This is the magnitude of the transfer function. And here's what happens to it as a function of phase margin. If you have lots of phase margin, 90 degrees, the transfer function just falls off nicely. As I reduce the phase margin, in fact, if I have 45 degrees of phase margin, the, the gain will peak up a little bit. And a lot of you saw that. Remember you saw that in your source follower or in your last circuit. You saw a little bit of peaking. That's because of the feedback you've got going on in that source follower. And that little stage has a phase margin, something on the order of maybe 45 degrees. As you reduce the phase margin towards zero degrees, towards instability, that peak gets larger and larger. In fact, when you hit zero degrees phase margin, this thing's going to infinity. So more phase margin, you don't get this little peak in the frequency response. This peak is happening around that first pole. It's basically That first pole is basically at omega p times 1 plus t. Now remember, there's all other poles moving all over the place, so the, comp the stuff going on here is really complicated. But we're kind of looking at the bottom pole here and what's happening there, and we're kind of okay there. Even that has some problems. If you've got a couple of poles that are close to each other, things don't, you know, the phase margin and this little plot that I'm giving here won't quite work okay so well. But that's the best, but generally phase margin implies peaking, okay, right? And if you look in time response, in other words, if we look at time response, as we go to zero degrees phase margin, the things begin to oscillate. It's, it will oscillate at this frequency, at this first pole location. Pole times the 1 plus t. Okay? So this is why phase margin is a really important number. First, it gives us some margin. The second, it tells us how far away we are from instability. And sometimes we'll have a specification on how much peaking you have in your frequency response. And sometimes we don't want the frequency response to sort of peak up like this. We want it to be nice and flat. Well, that means you've got to have a phase margin that's pretty high. More phase margin means we're moving that first pole to a lower frequency. Okay? Let's take a little break. <laughs> it's so hot in here. Let me get some water.
<laughs> Get it stored on <laughs> archive it for permanent record, right? <laughs> the third row back is a tough row, it looks like. Right? <laughs> <laughs> What class is this? 150. So what are you doing there? What do you have to do? What's the project? Pong? Okay. okay. So you're actually running at the FPGA area? Or? It work? A lot of debugging. A lot of debugging, yeah. That's right, right, right. Yep. That's the real world, right? Making spice is bad enough. Making real hardware work is another level, right? <laughs> okay, let's go for it. All right, so um, what I'm going to do is uh, do a compensation problem for a, a, s a straightforward circuit, and we'll just kind of talk about what the issues are, and then we'll get into real transistors again. Okay, so... Um, Compensation. So here's, I just summarized what I just said a few seconds ago. One way is to decrease the feedback, but sometimes that's fixed. You can't do so well there. You'd like, you, but something you, we just saw, one thing is you reduce the open loop gain, which was a reasonable good idea. Another way to think about that is you can sort of see what happens. If you have too much gain, you're not going to make this thing, it's going to be very difficult to make it stable. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. It becomes pretty obvious. So having lots and lots of gain, you think, wow, that's really good. I can make the T prime really big. You know, I'll make output resistance really small. But it increases to the stability problem. So there's a trade-off there, right? Okay? Yeah. So is it possible if you have, like, a really small gain for each state, then you have, like, let's say if you have five different pair, right? And each gain for each if pair is really small, let's say two. So is this okay or Okay. That's good question. Great question. Don't know where you got that circuit, you know, five diff pairs in a row, but I <laughs> I can imagine. Okay, so let's take the let's take this case. Let's put five diff pairs in a row with all the poles at the same frequency. Okay? So here they are. So we're gonna follow. So we have. Let's 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 do the Bode plot of that thing. Okay. So here's magnitude of, and let's let let's let a f equal to one. Just a okay. So we're, we can work with a of omega. I mean, we can easy enough to change this, right? So so let's look at a of omega, which is for this case where f equal to one is equal to t of omega, right? And let's say you start off with a gain of how much? How much gain you got? No, no, but all the, all together. 32 or something? 32. Okay, so. So we've got a gain of 32, and we have five poles. Now think about five poles, and this is going to be falling off now at, by the time we get at, at, let's, okay, so here we go. So here's omega P1 equals omega P2 equals da 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 da. Okay? At that first, at that point, the mega p point where all these poles are at. What's the phase shift at that point? 45 times 5. So this is at minus 225. So this phase shift, it started back at point 0.1 of this omega p thing, right? This popular pole location, right? All right. <laughs> And it, by the time it gets to omega p, we're at minus 225. Where's the point of interest? 
minus 180, which was sitting back here somewhere, right? Here's minus 180. And let's say I want to have 45 degrees of phase margin. So that's sitting back up to here somewhere, right? So you have minus 135 degrees. So we can see if this circuit's stable or not, okay? So the question is, did at, well, actually, is this circuit stable? <laughs> We're toast, right? <laughs> We go up here, we got a gain of 32 at 180 degrees. We got a gain of even more, uh, still 32. So, it, in actual fact, that circuit cannot be made stable. So, it gives you a little insight into your next project, right? <laughs> you can start with the same circuit you had on the last one, which had really good bandwidth, but you can see a problem here, right? Lots of stages are really good for getting lots of bandwidth, but they're really bad for stability. That's life. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do anything about it, right? right? In actual fact, probably going back to your first project um, circuit will be a better one, because that was only probably two stages, right? That one will probably you'll have a better chance of making it work. <laughs> okay, right. But, okay. So, does that answer your question? <laughs> All right. So let's take not such a complicated circuit. Not one that has really what you got to do to make this circuit work. This is actually not a bad circuit. What you have to do though is add another pole, or take one of these poles and move it way back. That's really what you got to do. It's best to not add another pole. It's probably best to take one of the poles you have and move it to a very low frequency. Take the worst one and make it work for you, okay? So let's take a circuit that has, so this is kind of a little review what I just talked about you know, before the break. Let's take a circuit that has three poles, omega one, P1, omega P2, and omega P3. Let's say what we're trying to do, so what's going on here? Uh, okay, so here we, so we start off with this. Okay, if, now there's two ways to think about it. If we add, another, this is the mo method of adding another pole. So this is adding a pole. So if we start off with, this is our transfer function, and we add another pole, and so what's the gain right here? The gain right here is, let's say, magnitude of A0, 1,000, million, whatever it is. If we add another pole, where does it have to go to give us 45 degrees of phase margin? Well, like we calculated a few minutes ago, this pole will have to be moved back by the loop gain, the, the low frequency loop gain. So this, if this is times f, right? If that's the value of the gain at this point, right? In this point in time, we've got to have a pole that's added so that the gain is one at the first pole location. So that means this pole, omega P1, another pole has to be added at omega P1 divided by A0 times F. And then we'll call that the compensation pole. So this will be the compensation pole, or dominant pole. Now you can see why the low frequency pole was so important to us, right? Because that's our dominant pole. And I also said the really important thing was, was the first non-dominant pole. That's this one right here. Because that, it's that pole, you're going to get 90 degrees of phase shift from the dominant pole, your compensation pole. It's the first non-dominant pole, the second pole, okay, that tells you where the first pole has to be placed, right? You got to go back be, behind that first, that second pole to figure out where the first pole is, and you go back by the loop gain, the low frequency loop gain, okay? So for Question. here, yeah. So in this case, in you putting another additional pole, or you just move that pole to... This one here, I'm, I'm, I'm adding another pole, right? Because I left omega P1 alone, okay? Typically, that's not a good thing to do, right? If, if we can take omega P1 and move it back, then what is our next non-dominant pole is omega P2, and we win, right? So that's typically what we'll do. We'll find the worst pole in the circuit, make that the compensation pole, and then move it to a lower frequency. Okay, that's narrow band compensation. All right, and 
So let's just put some numbers in here just for a second. Let's say what 45 degrees of phase margin. Our our compensation. Let's say our first pole was at one megahertz, which is pretty low. But let's say we had a loop gain of 10 to the fourth. That would mean our compensation pole has to be at 100 hertz. Okay? See a problem? How do you get a pole at 100 hertz? You can add capacitance, but boy, that could be a lot of capacitance. So sometimes it's actually difficult to make this pole low enough. It will start taking a lot of area just to do that. So don't worry about when that begins to happen, because that's probably true. The compensate will generally we'll add capacitance. We'll give we'll give you the size, the per unit area value of capacitance, and you will see that it's it's like resistance, right? It doesn't take much, and boy, to get a picofarad of capacitance takes a lot of area. You can have a thousand transistors in a picofarad of capacitance area, right? And so it's that same old problem again. But we'll talk about now about where you might put that pole, okay? Well, how you might do this, okay? So here is a good old standard op amp. So this is called the Miller op amp. Now you'll understand why it's called a Miller op amp. Okay. So here, differential pair. So this is a typical amplifier. Differential pair input stage, followed by a common source gain stage, followed by an output stage. And a lot of you in that first project avoided this middle stage. Right? You just had differential pair and no output stage quite often. Some of you did put a gain stage in here. Or some of you put some buffers in there. Okay? So several things you can do. Let's take this case, though. Differential pair, gain stage, output stage. Let's say the differential pair has a pole at omega P1. Let's say the output stage has a pole at omega P4. And let's this inverting stage, let's say it has two poles. It has a gain of GMRL, GM of this transistor times RL, and there'll be a, there's two poles. There's a pole on the input side and there's a pole on the output side. Let's say that's these two poles, okay? And where are those two poles at? Well, for this circuit, if we have an output resistance of this, let's call this R diff, okay? So this is the output resistance of the differential pair. If CGD is very small, where is the pole? Omega P2, if that's the input pole, will be equal to what? R diff times all the capacitance on this node. And let's say there's no capacitance associated with the differential pair right now, okay? Just we could include that, but let's not do that. It's going to be CGB plus CGS, right? So if this if this CGD is not there, okay? There's another pole associated with the output, and let's forget about the input capacitance to the next stage, and let's just worry about this capacitance right here. Omega P3 will be equal to 1 over RL times CD, okay? Everybody buy that? So the time constant of the output and the time constant of the input. So let me plot that. I'm going to do a root locus now. I'm going, to, I'm going to do a root locus now as a function of CGD. I'm not changing, I am kind of changing loop gain, but of this basic s feedback circuit right here. But let's just think of it. I'm just going to plot what happens to the poles of this circuit as I change CGD. Okay? This is actually a re review. So here's omega P3 and omega P2, and here's their two values if CGD equals to zero. So this is for the case when CGD equals to zero. Okay? Or very small. Let's now add another capacitor here. So here we have our compensation. So in fact, I, I give numbers here. Let me just put some numbers in. So I say that um, I have omega P1 is 10, meg, 10 mega radians per second. Omega P4 is 100 mega radians per second. So this pole here is at 
omega P4 is equal to 100 mega radians per second, right? And I'll say omega P1 is equal to 10 mega radians per second. I don't know where these poles are coming. Maybe this is the input pole, the differential pair. This is some pole associated with the output, the output, uh, output of the output stage, OK? So these are two poles here. I'm not changing those poles right now. What I'm changing is the two, I'm playing with the two interior poles. If I add a co compensation capacitor right here, OK? Why might I want to do that? Well, I might want to do that because probably this is one of our worst poles, right? If I have CGD, if I don't make it equal to 0, I begin to see Miller multiplication of CGD. So let's, let's make CGD finite, OK? So let's omega P2, and this is for CGD finite, is going to be equal to 1 over R diff times CGS plus 1 plus GMRL, right, the gain of this stage times CGD, OK? So what we're beginning to see is that that pole, this pole here, omega P2, is going to a lower frequency, All right? All right? Omega P4 was sitting out here. We'll worry about omega P3. Omega P3 was this other pole, but let's say it was right here. It was the next best, next worst pole. So here was the input pole to the common source stage. Here's the output pole of the common source stage. And here's the other two poles. So omega P2, if that was the input pole, it'd probably be really good, because of, and it's probably the one of the lowest ones, because it has this R diff of the first stage. And it has this Miller multiplication of CGD. So it's probably our lowest frequency pole. So let's begin to work with it and make it the compensation pole. And that's what Miller, that's why it's called a Miller op amp. You're adding a compensation capacitor in the worst possible place for frequency response, right? You're placing it across the gain stage, so it's going to be Miller multiplied. Okay? So omega P2 now is going to be equal to 1 over R diff times CGS plus. 1 plus the gain, 1 plus GMRL, times CGD plus C compensation capacitor. So this is an external capacitor that we put in our circuit. It's put on this extra. It's not a parasitic. We'll have to add this in in our layout. C sub C will quickly, probably will have to make it low enough, you'll find this out, will easily be much, much greater than C gate to drain. So this becomes negligible. GMRL is probably much greater than one, so we get rid of that. This is all probably bigger than CGS. So you end up with the next, that first, second pole being equal to 1 over R diff times GMRL times C sub C. Okay? So in other words, what's going to dominate is this output resistance of this first stage, the Miller multiplied compensation capacitor, and the gain of this stage here. So this becomes our second pole. That's this pole right here. What we're saying is as we make C sub C larger, that pole is going to lower frequency. Okay? It's going towards zero. Okay? You say, well, that's going towards instability, but it's also going to lower frequency. We're going to have to use that in order to be able to make this thing stable. Okay? Now, what about omega P3? What about the pole on the output side here? Where does it go if C sub C is really large? Do you remember that? C sub C gets really large, what happens? This becomes like a short circuit. So it's like we short this together. This becomes like a 1 over GM. So omega P3 which started off as this, ends up going towards GM over CGS plus CGB plus C sub D. 
omega P3 actually goes to a higher frequency. And it ends up going to this value right here. So that's kind of neat. I mean, it starts off at 1 over RLCD, which could be pretty bad, because RL can be pretty large. But by making this capacitor really big, this compensation capacitor, at high frequency, this becomes a short circuit. This looks like 1 over GM. So this output pole here actually goes to a very high frequency. It actually sort of gets out of the way. So we end up with the pole out here and the pole on the input side here. And we get rid of this output pole of the differential of this common source stage, which also is a pretty bad one, right? Because it's high, got a lot of high output resistance. We got rid of the input pole because that became our compensation capacitor. So this is a really good result, OK? So that's why Miller op amps are so nice, right? You kind of take some of your worst poles and you get rid of them. You turn one into a compensation pole, you get rid of the other one because of this GM business, this pole. This is called pole splitting. The pole split. OK? And you end up with the other poles in your circuit being the ones you have to worry about. So this is good. <laughs> OK. All right. Everybody see that? Any questions about that? So Miller op amps. And the nice thing about this is that we, we get this assistance on trying to make C sub C as small as we can. So let's put some numbers in. So we end up. <coughs> Let's say our diff's 10 mega ohms. Let's say the load resistance is 5 mega ohms. Okay, so this is 5 mega ohms. Our diff here is 10 mega ohms. CGS is a tenth of picofarad. These are big numbers. CD is 0.1 picofarad. Okay, 0.1 picofarad, 0.1 picofarad. That might include the input to the next stage, right? GM's 1 millimo, okay, right? Millisiemen, right? <laughs> Mega P1 is 10 mega, that's what I said before, is 10 mega radians. Mega P4 is 100 mega radians. Let's say the gain of A1, the gain up here, this stage here is 1,000. And the gain of the second stage was GMRL, right? And um, what's that going to be? It's going to be GMRL will be 10 to the minus 3 times 5 times 10 to the 6th. So that's equal to 5 times 10 cubed. So it's this, ga this stage has ga sta a gain of 5,000. This has a gain of 1,000. So we've got a gain of 5 million for the overall A0. OK? A lot of gain. OK? So let's say before compensation, I calculate all these poles. Omega P2 is a 10 meg 1 mega radian. Omega P3 is a 2 mega radians. OK? So I have. 1 mega radian, 2 mega radians, 10 mega radians, and 100 mega radians. That's my four poles, OK? Before I put in the compensation pole. So sure enough, the lowest one is the um, mega P2, which I guess was this one right here, right? Or is the input one, one on this side here, OK? Let's compensate for F equal to 1 and 45 degrees of phase margin. OK? So let's do our plot. So we start off with a pole at 1 mega radian. So this was omega P2. Here is omega P3. Here was omega P4, or 1 maybe it was. And there was 1 out of 100 mega radians, too. So that's omega P4 or something like that. OK? If we look at right now, this has a gain of 5 times 10 to the 6th at A0. That's the low frequency, just so I calculated. Okay. At the first pole, which is where we get the 45, we get, so we get 90 degrees phase margin, a phase shift from 10 from the first pole. We get, It's actually not quite exactly right, right? Because we're not 10 times above omega 10 to the 6, right? We're only 2 times above 10 to the 6 here, right? But if we look, go out here and look, 
Where is 180? This is not 135 here, right? All right. See that? Because at 10 times above 10 to the 6, we'll get 180, 90 degrees of phase shift from the low pole. We're only two times that pole. So we're only getting, I don't know, 10 or 15 degrees of phase shift. You can calculate it, right? So it's arc tangent of uh, omega over omega P2. And it, this would be 2 times omega P2 is at this point right here. So it's arc tangent of 2, which is, who knows what it is. I don't know. <laughs> So, 50 or 60 degrees by. So, we got 45 from here, we got 50 or 60 from there, we got another 45 from there. So, we we'll have to we can figure out exactly the phase shift is there. But we can clearly see the 180 degrees of phase shift is going to occur somewhere up in here. And this gain has not dropped off very much. We'll get a factor of 20 or 30 from the low frequency pole. We'll start getting another roll off from the second pole. But we're clearly not down by a million, okay? So the, so the roll-off is not enough to get this gain down to 1. So what do we have to do? We've got to take the lowest frequency pole and move it to a low frequency, lower frequency. When that happens, this second pole is going to move to a higher frequency because it becomes this GM over C thing, right? So our second pole will come actually probably be equal to this omega P, the 10 mega radian one, okay? So where does the lowest frequency pole have to go to give us 45 degrees of phase margin? Well, if it's if the second, if this is pole four or whatever it was, which pole is it? Mm, I don't know. Pole four was. I don't care. So mega p one. I said I think it's mega p one was 10 mega radians. 10 times 10 to the 6th, okay? The compensation pole will have to be omega P1 divided by A0. So this divided by A0. A0, we said, was 5 times 10 to the 6th. The first pole was at 10 times 10 to the 6th. So this means this pole will have to be at 2 radians per second. Wow. So doesn't this kind of, doesn't this hurt? Here you work so hard to make your amplifier really fast. Then what you got to do is go put a pole in that's at really low frequency to kill all the gain. Yeah, it's kind of a shame, right? <laughs> but it's better than having to think of an oscillate, right? So I guess that's your trade-off, right? You want to make an oscillator. It is kind of interesting. When you see circuits, very high frequency circuits, People will, you go to conferences and people will talk about doing very multi gigahertz circuits. They often won't talk about amplifiers. They'll often talk about oscillators. <laughs> Why do you think that? They may have started doing an amplifier and ended up an oscillator. Well, publish it, right? <laughs> so it's actually quite easy to do an oscillator at a very high frequency. What's really hard is to do an amplifier that has some, that doesn't oscillate, right? Okay. Okay, so we're down to 2 radians per second. Okay, so omega P2, we said was 1 over R diff times GMRL times C sub C. Omega P3 is really high, and so on. So now let's look at what we, ha we can put in here. So omega P2, let's put it in here. GMRL, we said, was 10 to the minus 3 times 5 times 10 to the 6, right? times C sub C has to equal 2. So C sub C is going to be equal to 1 over, this is 5 times 10 cubed, right, times 2. Uh, I'm missing something here. Oh, yeah, okay. And then we have to, we need to comp the compensation pole, right? So we need to get down by 5 times 10 to the 6, right? So it's this times 5 times 10 to the 6. So it's this times 5 times 10 to the 6 to calculate what the compensation pole is. Oh, this is... The first pole was at... Oh, that's no, not 5. Times 10 cubed, right? Was that... Um, it was GMRL, and GMRL was... Eh, my numbers are... GMRL. 
That's five times ten cubes, right? Okay, so c sub c is going to equal to one over omega and radians, the compensation pole in radians, times GMRL of the second stage times a zero of to get the pole down to you know gain of one get the loop gain down to one times I guess that's it right r diff which is r diff which was okay so here's the formula for compensation pole for the compensation capacitor you plug all those numbers in you get ten picofarads as the answer okay. That's big. 10 picofarads is actually quite large, as you will see, right? But that's the kind of numbers you'll end up with picofarads very easily, right? And you see, as you have more gain, you get bigger problems. You want more gain in that second stage, that helps you, right? We think. Okay. So um, we will continue this next Monday. Oh, the homework, late homework. We'll try to have, we won't hand out the solutions till next Monday. So you can turn in your late homework up to next Monday. I'll tell the